Reserve. Mark McCormick joins us now from Toronto Dominion Bank, their global head of FX strategy. Mark, I want you to revisit how you framed the dollar three months and six months ago, and then, of course, give us the now what. Sure, thanks. Um, it, it's all about a rotation from the 2020 liquidity trade to the 2021 macro divergence trade. And so the dollar kind of sitting at the epicenter of that, the market was positioned purely on liquidity, purely on low rates, low term premium, and that was the benefactor of a weaker dollar. So if you only thought about what the Fed could be doing, you, you extrapolated that trend into a weaker U.S. dollar for the entire year. Behind the scenes, growth was diverging. The vaccine campaign was getting off to better starts in the United States. And if you fast forward to where we're at now, we are seeing a much stronger dollar reconnecting with real yields because we're seeing more macro volatility come through the markets, through the VIX, through the move, and through currency vol. And that is flushing out all of these stale positions right now. How, what do you respond? How do you respond, I should say, to the weak dollar crew? It's clearly consensus. I know they've got to cover that trade, but but how do you respond to them and say there'll be a resiliency to dollar? Well, I think it also depends too. It's critical moving forward out of this positioning stage or this positioning element behind this transition of which basket you're looking at. I, I absolutely, we are still very bullish on the dollar versus the euro. But I think what you can think about is over the next month after we see this rates move flushed out, there is an element where the factors that we're tracking in markets that are making money affects its terms of trade. So it's linked to the commodity cycle. It's about carry. So again, yield pickup is important, but it's critically most important. It's all about economic growth. So you can see a world where in G10, European currencies underperform, but you could also see currencies that are leveraged to the global uh, reflation cycle still doing well. So your commodity currencies, your undervalued EM currencies, also EM Asia can outperform. So it's going to be, I think, a mixed dollar in the second half of the year. And that's part of this washout is correlations break down and it's no yep. longer dollar up, dollar down. You've used that phrase three times. Wash out, flush out, and I want to talk about it with you right now. This is how you get whipsawed making big trades. You get sucked into what looks like a flush out, then you extrapolate it out as the new trend. Mark, how complex is that as you look at things right now? And how difficult is it to actually draw a line between something that's just a washout and something that's the beginning of a new trend? Yeah, it's a great question because it's the context of the economic cycle. Are rates rising because the global economy is doing better? And that's a critical element. The taper tantrum was all about rates rising. We had mediocre economic growth through that period. Uh, what we see now is if we go back to 2017 reflation, rates are rising because economic growth expectations are rising. What we absolutely are seeing now is a combination that is very similar to that, where rates are rising to validate the rise in global growth expectations, which is coming through on the normalization of economic mobility. We're starting to see the breaks between COVID numbers and economic mobility, which is a huge element where vaccines have changed the way that people can move around the economy more. So it's not back to pre-COVID levels, but there's a higher new level of equilibrium, which means we need more vol and we need higher real rates. So in the context of that, what matters for markets now is that real rates are validating the move in economic growth. And, you know, on the side of it, there's obviously liquidity and other technical factors that are happening in rates. But once this settles down, it's a good equilibrium for, for risk assets. And so it's not purely a return to U.S. exceptionalism. It's a blending of global reflation and exceptionalism, I think, for the second half of the year. So another way of saying that is there's been a pain trade. It might be ongoing for a bit longer, but once that's over, the narrative that was at the end of last year will continue and reassert itself. Can you just talk about how much further the pain trade has to go? Sure, I'd say we, we got at least another month. If we look at our just our positioning model, think about the pain trade. Um, we're still talking about a dollar short that's a little under a standard deviation. So we are not even close to neutral levels yet. Um, so even if you look at some of the valuation models that we look at, what we see is that G10 currencies are still slightly overvalued, where EM currencies are the one trading at a discount. So we haven't seen the full washout play out in effect. And again, we still probably have on, on the real rates models that we look at that are uh, global macro based, we could still see another 25 basis points um, in real rates. So if you see that, again, in the context of the Fed coming next week, the ECB next week, we've got all these major central banks. If the, the moves are allowed to progress, uh, suggesting that, again, that it's, the economy is doing better, then that means there's more room for the dollar. So, again, it's maybe in broad terms another one and a half, two percent um, again, against all major currencies. But again, euro is now testing the 118 level. We could probably see a marginal breakthrough there. But again, I would say this is probably about another month to, to six weeks 
um, in terms of this pain trade across FX. Mark, I think the point you're trying to make here more broadly is that we're always looking for this broad-based directional trade that we can all just get behind and it chugs along through the year. And you're talking about nuance and dispersion. Within EM, walk me through the nuance now just to wrap things up. What's the favorite? Is there a LATAM lean? Is it Mexico? Is it the peso winner off the back of a huge plan in DC? What is it? So what's going to be interesting is because each of those baskets is going to trade differently. So if you go through LATAM, you'd probably want to pick currencies that are leveraged to the commodity cycle, leveraged to North American growth, and also trading at cheap valuation. So um, our EM team likes selling dollar max rallies. And again, you can see there's a nice discount. And if we get the $1.9 tri trillion in U.S. fiscal and a $3 trillion uh, uh, infrastructure package, North America looks solid. You got uh, the Canadian dollar, the Mexican peso should outperform other currencies across other regions. Right. Um, and again, if you go to something uh, like the ruble, the ruble would do well in that backdrop as well, yeah. uh, given it's linked to commodity prices. This Mark, is also like we Mark, like Norway. Mark, I got to be wicked quick here. We're out of time. I know you're a rate strategist as well. Mm -hmm. Do the foreigners show up to buy the auctions? Well, that's a that's a big element. I think that's a big part of what Priya's uh, call is, along with the U.S. rates team, is there is an element where supply is going to drive up uh, rates a little bit higher in the short run. So the auctions can not go maybe as well as people are expecting, and that's part of the, the, the continued sell-off we're getting okay. rates in the next month. Um, okay. And that would also you know, drive well, this pain trade. Mark, congratulations on your call. It's so out of consensus. It's just wonderful to have you on.